we're going to be talking about legal protections here, about how the law can shape better futures. There's an old English saying that if the law is an ass, it's your moral duty to break it. I'm going to invert that and say if people and organizations or indeed nations are behaving like asses, uh, then it's our moral duty to make them obey the law. Uh, so we've got an amazing lineup of speakers as always. Uh, and kicking us off will be Lorena Ruiz Huerta. Uh, she is an activist, lawyer, eco feminist, and former member of the Madrid Assembly. Uh, she is a razor-sharp debater. She is also part of the Greenpeace family, uh, a lawyer for Greenpeace Spain. Um, I'm a director for Greenpeace UK, so we're all in the Greenpeace family. Um, and she's now spearheading the climate lawsuit against the Spanish government. Uh, so she's going to be talking to us about taking Spain to court over climate. So give uh, a not too hot welcome, uh, a nice warm, modest welcome to Lorena. He's coming. He's coming. Sorry for this. It's working. See. Sí. Okay. Thank you. Bueno, pues muy buenas tardes. Good afternoon. I would like to start thanking the organizers of the Fixing the Theatre Festival for having invited me to take part in the conference. I work as a lawyer in Greenpeace, Spain, and I'm going to speak this afternoon about the lawsuit against the Spanish government. Please remind me to advance my slides as I move on. I'm going to start by asking you a question. Is there anyone who knows what a strategic lawsuit is? Today it's a very fashionable word amongst lawyers, and probably they are familiar with the concept. No one in the room knows what a strategic lawsuit is? Well, it's not any lawsuit, like when you go to a, an attorney's office to manage a divorce. The time counter is not working, so not to be blamed if I run over my time. So I was telling you a strategic lawsuit is not any form of lawsuit. It's a tool in law that is aimed at launching a campaign, and it's based on three important pillars. The legal pillar, that's why it's a lawsuit, which is a legal concept, and it entails, of course, a legal procedure before a court. But it has two other very important pillars, communication and mobilization. So in many cases, those of us that run climate lawsuits, we are asked whether activists have abandoned the street, and why is it that we are focusing on the legal system? Well, we are now focusing on the legal system because we believe that climate change is an emergency. There is scientific evidence around it, and the situation is irreversible, and that is why we need to go one step forward and ask for legal protection. At the same time, we know that our lawsuits are difficult to win because somehow push the limits of the legal framework, and this is why we need a great deal of social support, a great deal of social mobilization, as well as media coverage, raising awareness about such lawsuits. Because oftentimes the rulings, the legal rulings that are sometimes revolutionary, request of a previous battle to be won in the street, right? It needs to be, let's say, something that affects and matters to citizens. And sometimes those of us leaving a strategic lawsuit asks we ask ourselves, what does winning mean in this case? Well, beating or winning the case is not necessarily the target, right? We want to win the case, of course, and receiving a positive ruling is good for us, but it's very important also for us to 
beat in terms of narrative. This is a form of, of awareness raising campaign. In this case, a very important topic such as climate change in Spain. What is a climate lawsuit? Climate lawsuits are growing, are on the rise. The majority of them are against large corporations due to their highly polluting activities, which, of course, have a negative impact in terms of climate change and produce terrible disasters. But more and more lawsuits are tackling governments due to their lack of action before climate change. There are climate lawsuits in more than 40 countries in the world. In the US, there's also a lawsuit against the government, also in Canada, New Zealand, and many others in Europe as a result of the very successful case of the Urgenda Foundation against the government, the Dutch government. And one of the lawyers who will speak after me will tell you more about this lawsuit in the Netherlands. Here I display Shell's logo because one of the most successful cases has been the judicial ruling that many NGOs in the Netherlands won against Shell, which has been now considered responsible of climate change and condemned for undermining human rights. Why are climate change lawsuits timely? Now in Spain we have a government that claims to be the most environmental friendly government ever, and this is true, considering that the former MP in Spain was in denial of climate change. So, of course, we know that this government is doing much more than previous governments. At the same time, we are amidst a health and economic crisis, an unprecedented one, and governments told us that we would we would build back better after COVID-19. We are receiving also the next generation European funds, and we are now reaching the conclusion that they are not being invested in a sound ecological transition, the one that would be required in today's environment. On the other hand, Spain has been polluting a lot in the last years, much more than the European Union said. The European Union decided to allow Spain to pollute a little bit farther than other European Union countries back in 2005, Spain's CO2 emissions limit was a maximum of plus 15 percent compared to 1990s, and what they did was to make the most of this prerogative, and in 2015, Spain emitted 53 percent more CO2 emissions than in the 90s. The economic crisis was the only way to cut down CO2 emissions in Spain. So Spain has been emitting far beyond the established limits, and as a result of that, they need to pay a debt, right, or a fine. Also, it has to be considered that recently the human right to the environment was adopted by the UN General Assembly, and we consider that what makes sense is to lobby against the government, because if they claim to be pro-environment, well, we'll ask them to actually be and not uh, let's say surrender before the pressures from lobbies. Spanish government policies in terms of CO2 emissions reduction are not aligned with the international commitment that the Paris Agreement entails. The Paris Agreement includes the possibility to make sure all member states do their utmost to ensure that the average global temperature does not overcome the increase of 1.3 degrees. And now science has confirmed that no country in the world are doing what it takes to ensure such a commitment. And scientists tell us that at least we should be reducing our emissions by 
7.6%. So Spain should reduce their emissions at least 55% their emissions by 2030 in order to fulfill the agreements signed in the Paris Agreement. Reality of climate change in Spain is quite horrific. If you have spent the summer in Europe, and even more importantly, in Spain, you will have experienced the extreme heat waves, 42 tropical days. In six days, 510 people died as a result of heat waves. Spain has seven of the 10 river basins with highest hydric stress and 75% of our land is in danger of desertification with a terrible impact that this will have in agriculture according to a Kogam recently published report. Kogam is a confederation of trade union well, according to this report, the impact of climate change might entail a decrease of up to 11% of our GDP. The same applies to tourism. The impact in, of climate change in tourism in the south of Europe will reach horrifying percentage of up to 11% of the Spanish GDP. So what is the main aim of the Spanish climate lawsuit? Many NGOs, Greenpeace Spain, Oxfam Intermoon, Ecologistas in Acción, the coordinator of NGOs for Development, and five young boys and girls of Fridays for Future, we've sued the Spanish government. We have amended the national action plan on climate and the environment, where they state their forecast in terms of CO2 emissions in the upcoming years. As I said before, the scientific community recommends a reduction of 55% of CO2 emissions, and our super ecologist government approved 23%, a 23% target in terms of CO2 emissions reduction. This will not bring us to the ecological transition that our country requires to, to avoid terrible impacts of climate change. And this is the plan that we have impregnated. Of course, the background of the lawsuit are not even, let's say, put in question by the Spanish prosecutor. We base our economy on a large consumption of fossil fuels, which, of course, produce CO2. And as a result of that, climate change and the rise in temperature. Also, the lawsuit is, of course, nourished with scientific evidence. Numerous scientific reports point at the fact that climate change is a fact and we need to act urgently. The reports of the IPPC, the Program of the United Nations for the Environment, and many others that even go one step forward and even Mm, state the amount of CO2 emissions reduction according to the fair share, because of course the more you have emitted, the more you need to be, let's say, uh, solid in reducing your CO2 emissions. Those countries who are least developing probably shall be entitled to it more than others. So scientific evidence supports our lawsuit and also we have a legal basis because Spain is a member of many international treaties on climate and human rights and our constitution says that international law is applicable in the Spanish border. So Spanish judges are obliged to apply international law that includes the Paris Agreement and also other principles of international law, such as shared responsibilities, shared and differentiated responsibilities according to this principle. Climate change is the responsibility of us all. So we are all responsible, but there are some who are more responsible than others. Those who have polluted the most shall reduce them the most. There's another very important principle in terms of intergenerational 
equality. We cannot leave a planet to our youth where they cannot have a dignified life. We have the moral and legal obligation of leaving future generations a country where they can leave. There's the European Court of Human Rights that even if it recognizes that the European Pact of Human Rights, there is no such thing as the right to the environment, the European Court of Human Rights says. But when governments do not protect the environment, they are undermining human rights because, well, there is a right to having a family life and the right to life. When the environment is not properly protected, this has been said by the European Court of Human Rights, and on the basis of this doctrine, many of the lawsuits that NGOs like Greenpeace and others have suited their government due to their inaction, lack of action in terms of uh, adaptation to climate change, and their national courts have uh, said they are right. So it's a very urgent scenario. Every additional tone we throw into the atmosphere accumulates and worsens. The problem the scientific community is very clear. There is a very little carbon budget left, so we need to act now. We need to reduce our CO2 emissions now. And as I said before, the rights of future generations are a moral and legal obligation. We cannot leave them a world in which they are not allowed to emit not even a gra gram of CO2. Let me conclude with this. And now what, right? Well, first of all, sign, please. You can download this QR code with your phones, and this will bring you to Greenpeace website, where we are gathering signatures, support signatures for the lawsuit, for the Spanish lawsuit in France. They obtain even 2 million signatures in a short period of time. Citizen support helps a great deal. Citizen support is key so that courts feel compelled to adopt a positive ruling. We understand it's not easy to rule against a government who is doing more than others. So citizen support is very important. What else? How can we bring citizens closer to law? Every time you face a severe environmental problem, you can get organized, find lawyers, and please promote a lawsuit from the basis through mobilization, through social action, and with a great deal of imagination, of course. Thank you very much for your attention, and I am sure we'll have time for more debate and for a Q&A. Thank you. I'm going to invite Lorena to take a seat on here. Um, if I can, we maybe take the second seat. Second, yeah. <laughs> you make me want to get in the mood to sue the UK government. I just need an excuse. Um, so, our next speaker, um, and then we'll have a Q&A uh, with Lorena and our next speaker, uh, is Lucy Maxwell, who will be joining us virtually, um, who's very kindly stepped in for Dennis Van Berkel. Uh, Lucy uh, is also a human rights and climate change lawyer, and she is co-director of the Climate Litigation Network, which is a project of the uh, Genda Foundation um, that Lorena mentioned. Um, and Lucy also specializes in these strategic uh, state-based climate litigation um, campaigns. Uh, she's an Australian qualified lawyer currently based in London. So hopefully, Lucy, are you with us? We think. Come in, London. Yes, hi. This is where the kind of the great wheels of technology turn very, very slowly indeed. Um, Can you hear me okay now? Is there a signal from our technology team? Oh, lovely. As I said, they turn slowly. This is 21st century, after all. Um, I think I'm right in saying there is something like 1,800 climate lawsuits in progress globally. Yeah, yeah, it's a big number. 
So the law is getting very busy uh, indeed, um, which is a good thing. So Lucy will appear on the big screen, so we will look tiny, and then when we do the Q&A, she will hopefully appear on the small screen, and we shall see. We did Ghana uh, before lunch, so hopefully we can do London. Ah, Lucy! Hi. Welcome. I've already done a wonderful introduction for you, so everyone knows who you are, where you're from, and what you're going to talk about. So please, the stage is yours. Fantastic. Fantastic. I'm, I'm getting, getting a slight, slight echo. echo. Let me see what I should do. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll just press on. So it's, it's wonderful to be at today's event to discuss how law can shape better futures, especially on the climate crisis. About what we do at the Climate Litigation Network, which feeds into Loretta's discussion about how communities are turning to the courts. What we do at the Climate Litigation Network is work with community and lawyers around the world to develop lawsuits to ramp up states' mitigation ambition in line with their commitments under the Paris Agreement and best available science. We focus in particular. Sorry, I'm not sure whether everyone can still hear me. Let me just check what the um, messages are saying. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Okay, fantastic. It looks like it's okay. And now I've, I've lost my echo, which is, which is good. So I'll press on. But what we do is respond to what Lorena has described as the huge interest of communities around the world to hold their governments accountable for their commitments under the Paris Agreement and the best available science that they know about to reduce their, their emissions to help preserve our safe climate. And we focus in particular on communities who are wanting to take governments in the global north to court because those governments, as Lorena has mentioned, have heightened historic responsibility for climate change and a greater capacity to mitigate. So this is one of the big areas in which uh, courts are playing a role in the context of climate change. And we can, as Lorena mentioned, there's also a lot of corporate climate lawsuits, but I'll be talking today about lawsuits against governments. And I'll cover three things. The first is the background to the Dutch case brought by the Year Agenda Foundation, which you may have heard about already, and the impact that that case had in the Netherlands, and then the ripple effect that it had in cases around the world, including the Spanish case. But first, when we're talking about climate litigation, I always like to contextualise it in terms of the scientific um, evidence on the degree of crisis in which this is happening. Communities, as Lorena has described, have been using a range of techniques to try and get the kind of action that is needed in the streets, through political advocacy, and the, the courts are just one technique that are being used. And it's because the situation is so urgent. We know that the past decade was the hottest on record and extreme weather events are wreaking havoc around the world. And yet states are completely off track where we need to be to hold global heating to 1.5 degrees or below. Global emissions are still increasing despite decades of pledges to decrease emissions. And we're on track to global heating of about 2.8 degrees by the end of the century which the science is clear, the consequences would be catastrophic and they're already very severe now. So it's in that context that communities are turning to the court. And I'll talk to you now about the, the Dutch case that was the first in the world in which a government was ordered by a court to reduce its emissions by an absolute minimum amount. And that's why it's so well known and it's, it sparked this ripple effect around the world. So the case was initiated back in 2013 by a Dutch sustainability NGO called the Agenda Foundation and about 900 Dutch residents. And they were looking ahead to where the Netherlands was, what the Netherlands was doing regarding its emissions by 2020. And it was, they were seeing that there was just no consistent effort to reduce those emissions in line with best available science. And it said, your actions now are going to endanger our future because you're not going to do your part to prevent dangerous climate change. Mm. And that's 
a violation of you, the state's duty to protect us as your people under human rights law and under the civil code. And they said to the government first in a letter and then to the court when the government didn't respond, the science is clear about what you need to do in terms of reducing your emissions by 2020. And in this case, it's a reduction of, of at least 25% against 1990 levels. So that was the order that they sought based on the science. But this was the first time really that a court had to determine, is this a legal question? Does the state have a legal duty to reduce emissions? How do we determine that? And so the court was faced with very new questions. And the first decision was made in 2015. And there the court said, yes, the government does have a duty to protect people within its jurisdiction from the harm posed by climate change. And this is a duty that operates now, even though the worst impacts of climate change are yet to come. But it's action now that is needed to prevent those harms. So it's a preventative duty, doing reduction now to prevent more harm in the future. So the important thing was that that duty was recognised. And what the court went on to do was look at the science that the plaintiffs had produced about the emissions reductions that were needed for the Dutch state to do its part to prevent dangerous climate change. And back then, they were looking at what reductions were needed by 2020. And the court affirmed that at least 25% at least reduction was needed. And that order was made. So from 2015, there was a binding order in the Netherlands that the Dutch state within five years needed to get its emissions on track to a 25% reduction by 2020. So the Dutch government started to introduce measures to meet that court order. But at the same time, it appealed the decision. But it was unsuccessful on two occasions in appealing through the Dutch courts. In 2018, the Court of Appeal upheld the court order and it based its decisions um, on the state's human rights obligations. Then in 2019, the state went to the highest court in the country, but again, the court upheld the original decision and the order that the government must meet that reduction by 2020. And that was huge because that was the, that was the, the highest court in any country to affirm that the state has a legal duty when it comes to climate change mitigation, reducing your emissions. And the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights said at when that judgment was made in 2019, and I quote, the decision confirms that the government of the Netherlands and by implication other governments have binding legal obligations based on international human rights law to undertake strong reductions in emissions of greenhouse gases, end quote. So this decision was about the Dutch government but it has relevance for governments around the world because the basis is human rights law and science, and they have parallels in almost every other country. And obviously the science is universal. So the impact of the case in the, in the Netherlands was very significant from that first decision in 2015. It transformed climate policy in the Netherlands and it put climate change on the public and political radar because the public were engaged in the case from the very start. There were almost 900 people that were part of the case officially as co-plaintiffs, and there was media coverage throughout. So the government knew it was being watched from the moment of that first court order. And what it did was pass a new Climate Change Act with an ambitious target for 2050 at that point, adopted a coal phase out by 2030, closed a coal-fired power plant, and then adopted a, a cap on coal-fired production at 35%. And then after the Supreme Court decision, it adopted, this was in, in, in 2020 by this point, a three billion package of measures to meet that reduction order for renewable energy and energy efficiency measures. And then last year, a new government adopted a further seven billion euro package of measures to reduce Dutch emissions. And the last thing I'll leave you with, which would be great to talk about if we have some time and questions, is the wave of cases around the world that we see that are um, 
using a similar approach to hold their governments accountable to their climate change commitments and to the science that governments know about. So this type of case against national governments, there are more than 70 of these cases. And as Lorena mentioned, they are, there are many in Europe, but many also outside, in New Zealand, in Mexico, in Brazil, Australia, Canada, the UK and the US. In Europe, in the last two years, we've had a number of very important legal breakthroughs in other similar cases. So it's no longer just one Dutch case where there was a successful ruling. There have been successful outcomes in cases against the governments of Germany, France, Belgium, Ireland, and the Czech Republic. And in each of those cases, the court has accepted that climate change does raise legal matters that it can consider. And in a number of those cases, that the state has a legal obligation to reduce its emissions in line with science or the commitments it set itself in order to protect people within its jurisdiction. And that is, they, they are rulings that no one would have thought was possible seven years ago. But now we have a growing consensus amongst courts, particularly in Europe, that these are legal matters and that climate policy is not a matter just for politics. It concerns rights and it's a matter for courts to adjudicate. Um, so I'll leave you on that and very much look forward to discussing more during the Q&A. Thanks. <clears throat> Great. Thank you very much indeed, Lucy. So uh, we're going to have a, um, a few moments for questions. Uh, I will open that up to the floor in a moment, but there's one burning question I would like to ask perhaps both of you. Um, I guess it's clear in one sense from the Dutch experience that because the Dutch government obviously appealed the case twice, um, that they were a bit resistant um, to the implications uh, of the strategic lawsuit. But what are the responses of governments in private? I'm really intrigued to know there may be a public stance, but do they sort of hint that this is helpful because it enables us to do things which are politically difficult. Do they say, oh, give us a break, you know, we're trying our hardest, or is it a straight piss off and leave us alone? What is the private response from government? Okay, I like very much this question, yeah. <laughs> a very interesting one. Um, uh, for us, the experience has been very bad because the Minister of uh, Ecological Transition Ministerio de Transición Ecológica. Uh, well, she is one of the most ecologist persons or people in the government, but actually she, she was very upset with us when we started this litigation because, uh, well, and, and actually she, she called us for a meeting, for a private meeting to ask for responsibilities. Like, what are you doing to me? We are supposed to be friends, we are supposed mm. to be allies in, in this fight, and why are you doing this to us? Our answer has always been, this is a help for you. Mm. You can try to see it as, uh, as something that helps you in implementing uh, mo the most ecological policies, as you have a lot of pressure in the other side, from the oil companies, energy companies, etc. So this is good pressure for you, but she, no, she didn't like it at all, and she's, she's been upset for almost three years now that oh. the, the litigation <laughs> is, is lasting. So she took it very personally. Yeah, very yeah. personally, absolutely. Yeah. And actually she also, um, I don't know the word in English, but she desarrolló, uh, desplegó. Um, she, she started like a diplomat uh, <laughs> campaign in, 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 in foreign newspapers that start after our lawsuit. Uh, the, the foreign newspapers started speaking about the Spanish uh, ecological policies that was a, an example for the entire whole world. So well. <laughs> <laughs> Which is obviously why you're suing her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Lucy, what's your take? Yeah, I would, I would echo what Lorena said. Maybe, Maybe I can, I'm, getting the, I'm getting the echo again, sorry. Um, but basically, I think the governments generally 
find that, there uh, we go, thank you, so it's, it's stopped again. Um, yes, I think governments may well find that the cases offer them political cover. There is a that, that one minister will say, um, without, without this, this lawsuit, lawsuit, I could, I could never, never have pushed for more ambitious, ambitious policies within, within the cabinet. cabinet. Um, publicly, publicly, obviously the governments have to defend their very weak climate efforts. And I think that that's what is so powerful about a law, is so powerful about a lawsuit is there's no hiding from the facts in court that you, if you want to challenge a lawsuit and, and indicate that your measures are scientifically um, reasonable, you have to find an expert who will, who will say that for you. And that's very challenging. So I think um, maybe behind the scenes, it helps some of those within government that are more um, ambitious, which is certainly what we want. But, um, and publicly, there's nowhere to hide, really, once you're in court. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. So, um, I'm sure we have questions in the room. Um, so, let's uh, take them a couple at a time. So, lady here on the right in white, please. Thank you. Um, and this is for Lorena. Uh, maybe, maybe in Spanish, if it's okay. Um, Yes, I would like to know something. First, please bear with me if I say something which is incorrect, or maybe my question is quite naive also. But I've read that Portugal this year will reach the energy independence with, cle with clean energy. I'm Italian and I live in Spain, and I'm wondering which is the difference, because why Portugal is reaching their energy independence and my country or our country doesn't? Why? What's their advantage? Okay, if you don't mind, I'll also answer in Spanish. I'll try to answer your question with a personal opinion, because I'm just a lawyer, you know, I'm not an expert in energy. But I believe that this is uh, a question of uh, pure political will. We have a government that um, is like um, listening more to some lobbies. And this is not just in Spain, but I believe this is the case for mo most of the political um, and the politicians. So I don't know in Portugal, I don't know uh, also your situation. And in Portugal also, I don't know what's their specific situation. But I don't know, I think that the pressure of uh, capital and the big energy companies, this pressure is so important that, uh, well, even at the EU level, they have uh, approved that uh, oil energy um, is part of green energies. And of course, this goes against all the European and international policies um, for the protection of climate and the environment. So I believe that this is the result of a pressure. And so um, they uh, fall under the pressure of these very powerful lobbies. And in Spain, we have very clear uh, examples of um, of uh, revolving doors and uh, so here in Spain we have the two uh, main parties and we have many cases of these revolving doors and they always find very good positions um, in the uh, boards of these big energy companies so maybe this has something to do so we have an we are in an ideal country to have this energy transition we have a lot of uh, sun um, a lot of windmills and even in the best um, estimates, well, if we would implement these renewable energies, we would produce uh, beyond what we need. But I don't know why things go too slow and now we're going to face this very difficult winter this year with these um, very high energy prices in this um, framework in context of the war in Ukraine, but that's how it is. Yeah, I'm, really, I'm really sorry, uh, but we are going to have to move on, unfortunately, because uh, we have to get three more speakers in and we have another chance for Q&A. But um, Lorena and Lucy, thank you so much for joining us. A round of applause for these two amazing legal activists and campaigners taking the battle to the doors of government. So um, our next speaker, 
um, is Soledad Galejo. Now, Soledad is a senior lawyer on wildlife and habitats, uh, a marine and Mediterranean lead of Client Earth. Uh, if you don't know Client Earth, I thoroughly recommend you look them up. Um, the legal firm with the planet as its client. Um, Soledad is a nature defender, a biodiversity protection litigator, and water policy expert. And so she's going to be talking to us uh, about what it's like to be nature's legal eagle. So please welcome Soledad. Hi, thanks so much. I'm going to speak in, in Spanish. Uh, First, I would like to thank the organizers for having me here, and I would like to congratulate you for this fest fantastic festival. It was really a pleasure to listen now to Lorena and Lucy, my colleagues. Now I'm going to talk about our work at Client Earth. This is an organization whose aim is to defend and to protect the environment from the legal point of view. I am a lawyer at Client Earth and I am the lead of the marine and Mediterranean team. And our task is to protect uh, marine biodiversity in this area. I've just been nominated um, head of the uh, office in uh, Spain, so now I will have more competencies. And I came to this organization three years ago, but before that I worked for 15 years in the field of uh, biodiversity and water protection for the, the main uh, citizens, the platforms and defense organizations in Spain. I would like to say something um, which is quite important to me. Um, I've chosen this path because I realized that there was a lack of um, balance. There were many um, law firms working for interests, private interests, the interests of companies that were destroying uh, nature. And at the same time, there were very few lawyers who um, worked to defend um, nature. So I decided that this was the site I wanted to be because I thought this was more necessary. And I share this with many other lawyers. For example, in our organization, many other people are working on that. And in our case, well, for example, um, we, have, mm, we have a lawyer from uh, Milano, for example, that uh, joined our company with a lower wage, but they come because that's what they want to do. And there are many activists that feel that they need to work for nature. And so um, there is increasingly more lawyers that are gathering um, and working together for this protection. Now, I'm working also at Client Earth uh, to protect nature, but now um, the scope is larger because now I'm working also for the Mediterranean and for Europe. At Client Earth, we use law to the law to protect um, the Earth, which is our client, and the name is quite uh, self-explanatory. Our client is the Earth. We are more than 2,070 um, experts um, and 170 lawyers working in Europe, but also in Asia. We're also working in Africa, in America, and we work in an interconnected uh, way. We share strategies and knowledge and in a collaborative way, not just um, among us, we come from different legal systems, but we also do so with other social and environmental um, institutions in the places that we're working. This is one of the pillars of our way of working. And you can wonder what's the difference between your work and other the work that other environmental institutions are doing, such as, uh, well, the, what like Lorena and Lucy have explained. Well, what we contribute with as a differential aspect is that our working field is the law, whereas other organizations use that as something complementary. But in our case, well, we work in all the law cycle, we litigate, we have quite legal cases, uh, quite important number of legal cases open, but we also work in terms of the advocacy so that we have better plans and better laws that are really enforced. We work on the on training and um, capacity building at several levels, always uh, with experts, with scientists. We translate the scientific language into the legal language so that the Court of Justice uh, can um, 
make good decisions, and our strategic work is based on replicability. So if we have a case in Spain in a field which is important, for example, uh, pollution by nitrates or pesticides, at the same time, we try and see with other colleagues um, in other countries how the work that we are doing here can be replicated in other countries because we want our impact to be global. So we work in this interconnected way. And so something that um, may be working in another, in another country is adapted here to the Spanish um, characteristics. And so we are constantly exchanging um, strategies, information, and trying to replicate our work so that it can have a bigger and global impact. We also have a multi-legal approach in our organization. We have um, lawyer, lawyers um, who are specialists in different um, environmental fields. Um, I'm, an, I'm a specialist in the field of uh, water protection, but we have seen that if we want to have a systemic impact, and uh, on this uh, climate and biodiversity crisis, we need to be active in other areas. So we have specialists in bank, um, banking law, in pensions, in several fields of economy to have a bigger impact. We just uh, opened a case against Shell. Well, the action is quite slow, um, small, but um, um, they are doing some investments that uh, are not really positive. And so if they do not change their decisions, these actions would not make sense even economically for them. So we want to be there to have a good impact and to try and stop this double crisis in terms of um, climate change and loss of biodiversity. So we work all over the planet, but there is a strategic area for us, which is the Mediterranean Sea, because as you know, the Mediterranean Sea is uh, one of the places where we are suffering the most this uh, double crisis. It's a very rich area in terms of biodiversity. We have here some species uh, which are endemic here, and so uh, that's one of our focus uh, in Europe. For example, in the Mediterranean, we are working with um, other environmental uh, organizations such as WWF and Greenpeace in Greece and Italy against new oil and gas um, drillings in the sea in uh, areas affecting uh, marine turtles, dolphins, whales, and this impact also accelerates climate change. Then we are also working in Spain in the Mar Menor case, but we work with some ecologists in Murcia from the European law point of view. So we try to work from the legal um, approach to enforce the European law so that we can recover this type of places such as Mar Menor. And the main problem that we encounter, for example, in Europe, we have um, legal systems that are quite okay in terms of um, protection of the environment and the biodiversity, but then they are not enforced. They are not executed. And so, and even sometimes we have favorable decisions by um, courts. Well, they are not enforced. So we are also trying to be active there. And at the same time, since this problem of the uh, pollution by agricultural nitrates. This is not just happening here in Spain. This is also um, happening in Italy with some lagoons uh, polluted also in Brittany, in the Baltic Sea also. So for example, the work that we are doing in Spain with all the water regulation, the uh, regulation on nitrates and biodiversity. Well, we're trying to replicate this uh, with colleagues from other countries so that that work can also be applied there. Another legal case, for example, in Portugal, in partnership with nine Portuguese organizations and also with um, British organizations and Dutch organizations, we have a case against a new airport for seen in uh, Lisbon, Montillo Airport, which is um, really next to the uh, Tajo estuary. And this uh, airport would have a very negative impact 
on birds because this is a protected area and this will just not impact on the birds in Portugal, but it's going to affect birds coming from many other places, um, birds that uh, stay there for resting. So we are working globally because we understand that there are bigger cross-border impacts that go beyond the airport in this case. And of course, there is also the risk of collisions with um, aircrafts. So there is a risk for humans at the end of the day. We also work with uh, legal experts from different countries. We also have experts from Catalonia and we are working in some cases to put an end to the uh, trawl fishing that we have in the Mediterranean that has very negative effects for the uh, biodiversity and also for carbon, carbon sums. Then we have an ambition, an European and global ambition, which is that uh, by 2030, at least 30% of the marine areas in the Mediterranean are protected. This is an important work, and we are also um, very active in that because the fact of protecting these uh, marine areas allows us not just uh, to protect the biodiversity, but it also has some economic impact because uh, with this we have a more sustainable fishing activity. So what we try and do is to identify strategic area points uh, where we can act that could have an impact in, in those locations, but to add this to other uh, work so that this can be replicated. So at Client Earth, what we do is to use the law to enable the necessary changes in the different economic energy, um, food and other fields to take place. We want to have this impact globally so that we can recover the balance between the earth needs, the nature needs and human needs because we are part of uh, these natural systems. So their deterioration or their well-being would also be ours. Thank you. Take a seat. Yeah, yeah. Take the the second seat. That great. Thank you very much indeed, Soledad. So uh, I'm going to rattle uh, introductions out now, so we can get all our panelists up. So and get some Q and A in before the end of the show. Um, so our next speaker is Teresa Guerrero, um, who works uh, as the head of separate collection promotion of the circular economy area the, for the Catalonia Waste Agency. Um, she's had what you might call a rubbish career, um, a long professional experience in waste management uh, and she's here to talk to us today about rethinking the municipal waste taxation system. How do we get fair payments that change our behaviours to drive us towards turning more waste in, back into useful and valuable resources. So Teresa, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Hola, buenas tardes a todos. A ver, Good afternoon. Please raise your hand if um, in the last summer you thought about the climate change and the actions, the impact of our actions on climate change. All of you? Sure, because it was so hot last summer. It was impossible not to think about this. But uh, did you think in your footprint? Have you, have you thought of your impact? Not always. Of course, we need to use less water, we need to use less energy, we need to buy better, we need to try and consume more responsibly so that we generate less uh, waste. But there is something very, very easy. Just one simple action that might have a huge impact on the climate change footprint, which is the separation of our waste by materials. That's very easy and it's so important. However, in many places, we do not reach 50% uh, in terms of uh, separation. In Catalonia last year, we reached 46%, which means that the other half is still mixing. All waste is so all together, all in the same place. How can we change that? How can we motivate people to change that? What should we do? Uh, 
Can you help me? Great. So psychology says this very simply. There are two types of motivations. Intrinsic motivation, the one that makes us move because we know, because we understand, because we see the importance of our action. So then we act because we understand its importance. And then we have the extrinsic motivation, the one that makes us move to avoid a punishment or to get a benefit. We need to work with both types of motivation. So in the um, waste agency, we try to use this intrinsic motivation. We try to convey the importance of our actions, the importance of this separate collection so that we can recover uh, these resources by participating in conferences, in events like this one, because I've seen this with my own eyes when everything, with when all the waste is together and mixed, um, all this goes to these landfills. This is a huge hole um, on the land, and then there is this lack of control. Then everything is um, polluting uh, waters, and the emissions go to the atmosphere. And of course, it is um, we have this uh, methane uh, generation, which is 20 times uh, more um, powerful than CO2. But on the other side, I've also seen that um, we can get um, from the separated waste um, materials to produce new things. So we can separate this uh, metal waste and everything can be recovered and most of the plastics and also clothes. We've been talking a lot about clothes in this festival. Well, I've seen how you can create new products from all genes. So yes, we do recover um, these resources and th something which is uh, almost magical from the the food, the food uh, waste. Well, these food that we cannot use anymore and those plants that could not survive after this very hot summer, well, with some water, with some controlled um, conditions, well, these become fertilizers for our soils. So this is a direct value for our soils. This is so easy to do just by separating our waste. That's not difficult at all. This is a very simple action that has a huge impact. However, we do not reach 50%. Half of the waste is still all mixed up. So we need to use the other type of incentive, the extrinsic motivation. So for that, we need a legislation change. That's what we are doing in Catalonia. Raise your hand. Do you know how much do you pay in terms of um, taxes um, in one year? No? Well, we have this uh, type of um, flat uh, fee. We will always pay the same. So this is not motivating. So let's try and change that and let's try and implement a fair tax so that the more you generate, the more waste you generate, more you pay. And if you mix everything up in the same container, even more. And But if you separate waste so that we can recover um, resources, you will pay less. So we believe that with this double motivation, we will finally get and reach higher rates in terms of uh, separate collection. But of course, we need a um, meter. How can we know who's uh, doing things uh, right and well? Well, we have two systems. We can. We need to go to the door of your um, house, and we co we come to your house every day um, to know that you have uh, correctly separated uh, the uh, waste. Or, well, this can be done in many places. Actually, in Catalonia, we have 300 of our municipality. This is one third of the Catalan municipalities in Catalonia that are doing this door-to-door -door, um, system, and so the rates of separate waste collection is very high. And then. In more populated area, what we do is um, to have closed containers. So we close them. So when you get there, you need to identify yourself with a mobile, with a, a card. But we will be able to know who's using each um, container and how each citizen is separating or not the waste. And this will be then reflected on the taxes. OK, so we'll have both motivations. So what does motivate you? Why do you consume less water or less energy? Because you are sensitive or because it's very expensive? Probably many of us are sensible with the environment and intrinsic motivation is high. But when you speak with your colleagues, peers, relatives, please convince them 
it's very simple. It's just a small gesture. Recycling is easy, and the impact it has is just enormous. As Neil Armstrong said, a very simple gesture and a great impact on our CO2 footprint. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Teresa. Uh, now our final speaker before we go to our panel uh, is coming in virtually again. So um, I'm hoping the tech team are ready uh, to go live to uh, Macarena Montes Franceschini. Uh, now, Macarena is uh, an attorney and a doctoral researcher at the Department of Law at the University of Pompo Fabra, uh, and she works on the Great Ape Project there. So we've talked um, about the right of citizens to climate protection and lawsuits against their states and governments. Uh, we've talked about the right of habitats and ecosystems to exist and be protected and sustained, and the work of um, Client Earth and the Mar Menor. Um, um, and now we're going to talk about the rights of animals, our other fellow passengers and species on the planet we all share, because surely they have rights too. So, uh, Macarena, uh, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you very, Thank you very much. much. Uh, I hear an echo. Um, can everybody hear, hear me correctly? Yeah, okay. So today I'm gonna to talk about the rights of nature, uh, but focusing on the rights of animals. So in general, nature around the world has been considered as property and environmental law has focused on regulating humans' use of the environment and natural resources. So traditionally, traditionally the law has considered a healthy environment as a human right. Western thought has always kind of opposed culture to nature, viewing nature as something foreign that has to be dominated and controlled. And obviously this view has contributed to the environmental crisis because as we know, humans are not really separated from nature. We are part of it and nature is an interconnected system. So environmental law has not been able to stop the destruction we see around us. And we, see, we know that there are many pressing issues such as climate change, but also the uh, extinction of many animals. So the rights of nature have developed around the world as a response to the destruction of the planet and to a legal system that treats nature as property, but corporations as legal persons. So the rights of nature um, as a framework have incorporated on the one side the indigenous tradition regarding the protection of nature and the interconnection of all living beings with the Western liberal discourse on rights. So um, in this situation, we see that around the world, the rights of nature have been expanding gradually. So different cities, towns, and, and countries have been incorporating the rights of nature in their legislation, and also courts around the world have been recognizing the rights of nature to rivers, forests, among others. And one of the best examples of this is Ecuador that incorporated the rights of nature in its 2008 constitution. So the constitution in Ecuador says that nature has the right to exist, to forest, to regenerate, among other things. It says this in Article 71 of the constitution. And this made it its way into the constitution through a constitutional assembly and thanks to one, the political force of the indigenous movement and also on social movement against extractivism, especially the oil industry in Ecuador. So um, last year, there was a case that reached the constitutional court in Ecuador regarding a woolly monkey named Estrellita. So Estrellita was a monkey that was poached when she was one month old from the Ecuadorian Amazon. And she was probably poached to be sold in the illegal pet trade. And she lived with a family for 18 years. And somebody anonymously informed the environmental authority that a monkey was living in a private home. So the governmental agency confiscated Estrellita and put her in quarantine in a zoo. 
So Estrellita's human family uh, filed a habeas corpus. That is a legal action that is normally used uh, to free humans that have been illegally detained. And this, this, the lower court and the Court of Appeals denied the habeas corpus, saying that it was an action only for humans. And the, then the Constitutional Court selected the case because they were interested in uh, developing jurisprudence on this topic. And the court wanted to answer three questions. One, if animals can be subjects of rights in general, that is, if they can hold rights within the legal system. Two, if the habeas corpus can be used for non-human animals. And three, if animals can be subjects of rights protected by the constitutional rights of nature and Ecuador. So um, there's this figure that is called amicus curiae, that is a Latin word that means friends of the court. And this means that experts that are not involved in the lawsuit or in the trial can present an, a report worth with their opinion on the case. So I participated in this amicus with the Non-Human Rights Project and the Brooks McCormick Jr. Animal Law and Policy Program at Harvard Law School. So half of the, of the report was on the habeas corpus, so the Non-Human Rights Project worked on that part. And the part on the rights of nature and animal rights it was written by myself and Kristen Still, uh, working representing Harvard Law School. So in our amicus, we said that animals can be uh, considered subjects of rights, that the habeas corpus is appropriate for animals, and that, um, uh, and that animals can be protected by the constitutional rights of nature. And our amicus um, wanted to convince the court, the most important thing for us was to convince them that individual animals can be protected by the rights of nature. And why is this so important? Because up until now, environmental law and even the rights of nature had always focused on protecting animals as species. And we can see that this hasn't really stopped the extinction of animals or stopped the endangerment. And so we argued in our amicus that actually species are made up of individual animals. So what happens to an individual has an impact on the species. So the court should uh, say that individual animals are protected by the rights of nature. And we gave several examples. For example, for example, in the world, there are two white rhinos left. So if you kill one white rhino, you just destroyed 50% of that species. Then, for example, uh, an example that is known in Ecuador. In some regions of Ecuador, there are only, for example, 10 jaguars left. So if you kill one jaguar, you are obviously extremely impacting the species. But even uh, this argument is important, even considering not only endangered animals or like extremely endangered animals like white rhinos, but animals like woolly monkeys who are a vulnerable species. Actually, when humans poach animals in the wild, when we kill animals and hunt them, we really don't know the effects we're causing to that species. For example, if I kill an animal in the wild, I don't really know if I'm killing a mother, a, a sibling, or who I'm killing. So I am affecting that species because maybe I am killing, I am leaving siblings alive and they won't be able to mate and maintain the species. Or maybe I'm killing an important member of that animal community that is an important member within that animal society. Research has shown that many animals have complex societies. So for example, research has so shown that elephants, a matriarch elephants have a much have a much more experience than younger matriarchs. So an older matriarch is capable of saving her elephant heard from an extreme drought because she remembers a path to a water source where uh, she went with her herd many, many years ago. So imagine if we kill that matriarch, we can be condemning that herd to death because that matriarch has certain uh, knowledge about how to save her herd during uh, extreme droughts in Africa. So we don't really know who we're killing and all this affects animal communities. We also know that when we kill individuals, many, many, many species of animals suffer grief and suffer a lot. So when animals are suffering, just like when humans are suffering, their immunity is affected. So animals can get diseases and also reproduction doesn't 
uh, occur in the same way. Animals stop eating. They are more vulnerable to uh, other types of attacks and many, uh, many different things. So the individual animal is absolutely important. And so we made this argument and also we said that it is quite arbitrary to say that if the court would have said no, individual animals are not protected by the rights of nature, then how many animals would trigger the protection of the rights of nature? Would two animals be enough, a hundred animals? And this would mean that hunters could avoid this by killing one animal less than what the court says. So this is a very complicated question. So finally, the Constitutional Court agreed with us and, and considered and used our amicus throughout the, the judgment and said, Individual animals are protected by the rights of nature in Ecuador. And this was huge because it's a change from environmental law and even the rights of nature because they had always just focused on species, but also because now in Ecuador, animals have constitutional rights because the rights of nature are regulated on the constitution. So this will help animal advocates in Ecuador try to improve the situation for animals in that country. I don't know if I'm oh, how my, I'm doing with the time. I think that maybe I used it up. Um, but just to finish, um, I would just stress out that uh, there's a movement worldwide moving towards the rights of nature to improve the situation around us. And I would um, advocate for including individual animals in this movement and for the animal rights movement to sit down at the table with the rights of nature movement because it is gaining momentum throughout the world and individual animals should be protected and we must strive to include them in this movement. And even in countries without the rights of nature, we should strive to include them as individuals in the protection of the environment as well. So thank you so much for your attention today. Wow, I, I, it's the first time I've heard about Estreita, and uh, that woolly monkey might have quite a legacy um, by the sound of things. So um, thank you so much, Macarena. Um, let's go straight to questions from the audience. Um, people have probably heard enough from me, so let's just dive straight in with questions from out here. Um, there's at least two on the right there. We'll try and take them, try and keep your questions punchy, and we'll get through more of them. I'll try and take two or three, and then we'll answer them as quickly as we can. All right, uh, thank you. Um, my name is uh, Mark from Montreal, Canada. Thank you, everyone. A great uh, discussion. Um, my question is for Macarena um, about farm animals. So, so we, so billions of farm animals are are killed every year. Uh, are there any laws to try and protect uh, farm animals, or are they kind of the forgotten uh, animals on the side? Great question. Thank you. Um, do you want to pass the microphone back? I mean, yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Emma, and my question is for Teresa. I'm just really interested. I used to work for a waste management company in Scotland, and we really focused on soil segregating. So when you mentioned that, I was like, wow, and I didn't even know that they would, there was something like this in, in Catalonia and in Barcelona. So um, really... Yeah, interested to know how the whole taxation and um, the the plans and ideas you were talking about, how far along that's going. And it's quite general, my question, but just to know how it's going, basically. <laughs> okay, great. Um, next one, we've got one on the left here, please. So my question is for Soledad. Soledad, you've raised of you, or you've said rather, that you work with different specialists in pension funds and insurances. Is there any way that us citizens can ensure the Mediterranean Sea? Would an insurance company dare to ensure the Mediterranean Sea? Are you working down this line? Okay, that's a great question. So um, why don't we start with that one? We'll go through them in reverse order. So Soledad. Can we take out a collective citizen's insurance policy on the MED? It's a very interesting question. For example, when it comes to pension funds, well, 
many companies are investing in different assets with our pension funds. And what we are trying to do is to make sure that such investments do not target um, polluting sectors such as oil, because it's going to produce a great deal of problems in the future. So this is what we are doing. Now, when it comes to insurances for the Mediterranean Sea, well, Mining in deep waters. Mining in deep waters is a quite lively debate because it seems like, well, some companies want to start mining in deep waters, which would be yet another major environmental disaster. Mining in areas where the environmental richness is not even known. It's different. It's difficult also to the fine limits in the borders, right? So what we are asking is how do we know what's going to happen down there? What about if a disaster er, happens, if there is a leak, a, an oil leak, or what about if unique habitats are destroyed? How can we ensure such habitats, right? Who can dare uh, performing such mining in the waters. There's a principle, who pollutes pays, and it's not widely implemented, unfortunately. So all these ecosystems would fall under this principle, who pollutes pays. And these are the principles that we are raising to make sure that some activities are expensive, inefficient, that are not even worth investing in them, right? So when I speak about mining in deep waters, the same applies to investments in fossil fossil fuels. It should be made impossible because it's too expensive. Teresa. Uh, can we have a kind of, I know this is a pretty big question, uh, but could you give us a, a brief summary of where the source segregation taxation is now? So we basically use three elements. One, efficient models where people are not anonymous anymore, where users are not anonymous anymore. So we want to work in this door-to-door -door, door or models in which we identify users before the container is open, right? And in Spain and in Catalan, there is a slow switch towards efficient models. Then, of course, we need support from public administrations and perhaps the next generation funds. When well implemented, probably will have economic support, financial support, and some city councils are also adapting their municipal regulations to somehow promote such models. And now we are working with the Catalan Parliament in the approval of a Catalan bill on waste management. Now it is compulsory to introduce a waste management tax. It hasn't always been the case. So now we have this compulsory tax. All city councils have to impose this legally binding tax and little by little will work on the deployment of this fair amount or fair tax. And of course, we need to communicate. We need to communicate bidirectionally with citizens. We need to inform citizens. We need to bring them on board, not find them, right? We need to make a great effort in terms of communication. We need to also uh, thank citizens who are doing things well. So, of course, we need to charge them, but we need to raise awareness, promote knowledge, so that intrinsic motivation increases. I'm not sure I've answered to your question, but we can gather later if you want. Uh, Macarena, the small question of farm animals' rights, uh, or do we just, some of our animals are equal, but some of our animals are more equal than others? Yeah, well, uh, regarding farm animals, um, there is always a problem because the lobby on the meat industry and the dairy industry and all those industries are usually very strong. So the thing is that as the rights of nature uh, incorporate indigenous thoughts, so for example, in Ecuador, it's linked to the indigenous principle of good living or buen vivir, or in Quechua, it's called suma causai, that means living in harmony with everything that surrounds us, in understanding the world as an interconnected and interrelated place. And it is a 
kind of promotes a non-predatory living in every aspect, like our way of eating, socializing, consumption habits, etc. So if we think about that, the way we eat is actually quite contrary to living in harmony and to living in a non-predatory way. We have millions, as the, the person who has said, billions of animals locked up and tortured in different in, in factories around the world. So um, I think the rights of nature as a framework could help, it could also extend to farm animals as well, because the, nature is an interconnected system of all animals, not only wild animals. It includes humans, it includes all animals. So I believe that this framework does include farm animals. And well, there's an action that we can take today to help farm animals, and that's to stop eating meat, stop eating consuming dairy, stop doing that. And that's an, that's an action that we can all start doing from today. We don't need the law to change that. And that is a, a very important social movement that could help out lawyers that are working on animal rights, as well as lawyers that are working on the rights of nature as well. Thank you. Um, we've got time probably for one or two more, if you're quick. Oh, there's lots of hands up now. Uh, this is great. Last session of the last day, and everyone has woken up and is really animated. This is fantastic. I am going to have to try and pick two. Who thinks they've got the best question? <laughs> so I'm going to ask you to self-select. If you think you've got a brilliant question that's going to make everyone in the room go, wow, um, I'm going to take the person at the back and the person down the front here. Make them quick, because we've literally got two minutes. Hello and good afternoon. My question is for Teresa. I'm here, by the way, I'm here. Hello. So you have raised the topic or you have spoken about how to improve the system and this would go down the line of making citizens not anonymous when it comes to throwing their waste. We are all consumers. Well, it doesn't matter. My question is more oriented to rights. So in terms of transparency, some ha sometimes I have the feeling that I recycle a lot, but I'm not sure all my litter is recycled, how much it costs, and what is the return on investment of the effort that I do, because for me it's quite a big effort recycling everything. Is that, I mean, is, Do you want me to? Yeah, if you could respond to that, sorry. Look, that question took a minute, so if this is going to be the last response, I'm sorry. <laughs> So you're asking me about transparency. I've heard this oftentimes. Oftentimes people say, and to the land, they told me, oh, I've been told that everything is piled up together and not recycled. No, believe me, everything that is segregated is recycled. Nothing goes unrecycled, and a lot goes to that. We need to make sure segregation uh, pays back, of course, what's mixed up in the general container is not recycled, but if you segregate, you have to be assured that it is recycled, and it's at your disposal, you can visit the plant, of course, it's, the data is on our website, and I am sure we are failing in terms of communication, because sometimes, you know, I think we should install cameras in containers so that you can track your ways, but the information is there, and we need to communicate better. There's no doubt about it. Cost, of course. Doing things well costs money. It's There's no return on investment. It's not less expensive to segregate than not segregate. But when you start recovering all the resources and reintroduce them in a circular economy and we internalize all the costs, for sure, it's worth, economically speaking, also to segregate. But of course, segregation is expensive. That's why we have to pay taxes. But the challenge is you, who is segregating, should pay less than those who are making the system be much more expensive. So when people engage and when intrinsic motivation explode, there will be a change of switch, Thank you so much. change of balance. Uh, amazing panel to end the second day here. Please put your hands together for Macarena, uh, <laughs> Teresa and Sadago.